Uh, we'll get started with our class today, our very last class. Um, Salutary to your dog, can uh, you pray for us? If you can begin with the word, word of prayer, uh, we will take our class out. Okay, let's pray. Father God, we come before your presence in the name of Jesus, Lord, as we begin our session for today lord you bless our pastor give for the grace the strength the wisdom to teach your word in clarity so that uh, each one of us will learn new something new from this class also you bless each one of us lord we thank you we bless you we honor you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you yeah so uh we finished first john last week uh, so today we will be looking at 2nd John and 3rd John, uh, which only have one chapter each. Uh, now, the focus of these two uh, books, or rather these two letters, uh, is on traveling missionaries. So that actually is the theme. So these two um, letters are not very theological in nature. Uh, they give more practical advice on how to... Um, treat teachers and missionaries who may be visiting their house churches. Uh, so that's the main theme that we see over here. So um, let's get started, in fact. Um, if we were to look at the first few verses of Second John, uh, maybe we could read out the first four verses. Um, yeah, if we can have any one person uh, read out the first four verses of Second John, please. Second John, uh, the first four verses, please. To the elders, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. Yes, thank you. Um, so we see here, um, you know, like we looked very briefly in the introduction that we did to the epistles, um, that here uh, John just refers to himself as the elder. Um, so he does not use his name. Uh, but he just simply calls himself the elder. Um, he could have called himself the apostle, uh, but you know he just uses a simpler title, uh, a more common title. Uh, you know, calling himself just an elder of the church, you know, rather than using his uh, special title of apostle. Uh, so uh, he is now writing uh, to a church. And he is addressing the letter to the lady chosen by God and to her children. So the assumption is that probably uh, he is sending this letter to a house church uh, that is run by a lady. And uh, he refers to her as the lady who has been chosen by God. So she's one of the Lord's chosen ones. And it talks about her children. So over here, it's it most probably is not talking about just her biological children, but rather all of her spiritual children, all the people who meet in her home. Now, she might have been pastoring this house church, 
or she it, it's just that she may be the one who has opened up her home uh, for the church and maybe someone else was pastoring so we don't really have details regarding that uh, but um, you know when john is writing this letter he specifically addresses it to her now there are some commentaries which will say that the church is being personified over here as a lady uh, but this may not be the case because especially when we look at uh, verse 4 you know over there it talks about uh, how uh, john is joyful to see uh, some of her children walking in the truth and over there when the wording says some of your children walking in the truth it's talking about one singular your the your over there is referring to a singular person it's not the plural you which is being used over there uh, so most probably this uh, letter is being written to the person in whose home the house church is meeting and uh, because she is in some kind of spiritual leadership uh, you know all the people who attend that church are being referred to as her children uh, so john is greeting them and he says to the lady chosen by god and to her children whom i love in the truth you know he says and not only i but also all who know the truth so in the very opening line the emphasis uh, is laid on the truth he says uh, the love that i have towards all of you in this church uh, i you know express this love in the truth and all those who know the truth also you know express their love towards all of you um, so he's emphasizing the fact that these are people who are living in the truth they are not uh, part of the church which has gone out you know from the um, home church uh, to be, to get into false doctrines and to false teachings uh, these are uh, people chosen by god and they have chosen to stay in the truth of the um, of the original gospel which was presented by the apostles um, and uh, so he twice he you know emphasizes this fact that uh, they are in the truth and, th and that they know the truth. And then in the second verse, he goes on to say, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. So he emphasizes the fact that this truth that they are believing in is not just a concept. It is not just an idea or a philosophy. It's in fact someone it's not just something it is someone who is living in them and who will one day be with them forever so here truth is not just being presented as a concept it's being presented as an actual person uh, because what had happened at that time was that these gnostics and all the other uh, people who were you know uh, spreading false teachings they were talking about multiple truths they were talking about how, you know, um, based on your perspective, you see that as the truth. But based on my perspective, I see this as the truth. So there are multiple truths is what, you know, they were proclaiming. But here, you know, uh, John establishes the fact that there is one single universal truth. And that is an act, is a, is a person. Uh, so... We can't just say, oh, there are different versions of truth depending on your background and depending on your experiences. You can consider that as the truth. Well, I choose to consider this as the truth. No, there is one objective truth which is personified in the Son of God. Uh, so what he says alone is the ultimate truth. All the others who claim to have different perspectives will have to submit uh, and given to this one ultimate objective truth because Jesus declares and says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So if other people are presenting alternate truths, there's no life in those truths. The, 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 uh, those truths are not going to be leading to the Father because Jesus is the only way. He's the only way to the Father. And, you know, we see the same... Uh, um, 
danger even today, uh, especially in the new age, uh, you know, uh, philosophy, which is now becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, the common belief that is put forward is that, oh, there are so many pathways leading to the truth. So you, uh, based on your background and your experience, you follow one pathway and it leads you towards the truth. And then another pa person you know, uses a different pathway and they arrive at a different version of the truth. And it's all right for us to hold different versions of the truth is what you know is taught by um, uh, New Age uh, supporters. But if you're saying the truth is a person, then you can't say, oh, it, it's multiple things. It will have to be the, whatever that one single person is proclaiming. And Jesus clearly says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So if we are saying that Jesus is the truth, then whatever he says will have to hold as the one truth in which there is life and the one truth uh, through whom you know, we will be able to go to the Father. Uh, so therefore, he says, grace, mercy, in the, in the third verse, he says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. Okay, so imagine again for the third time in the third verse, he's again bringing in this concept of truth. And what is the truth? He emphasizes and says, Jesus Christ, the Father's Son. So who are the people who will enjoy grace and mercy and peace from God? They are the ones who will accept this fact that Jesus Christ is the Father's Son, uh, that he is divine. Uh, so only those people will be able to enjoy um, the truth and love which you know god offers uh, so when we look at this uh, you know this third verse in the original greek uh, it actually that sentence begins with the words will be with us grace mercy and peace from god the father and from jesus christ the father's son in truth and love so the the sentence starts off with the phrase will be with us the emphasis is on that uh, because um, in most letters, the you know New Testament letters, the greeting generally is, you know, may the grace of God be with you, may the love of God, uh, you know, uh, be established among you. It's like a wish um, that is made at the beginning of the letter, and uh, we see um, uh, Paul using that format. For instance, if we were to look at Romans chapter one verse seven. Um, this is what he says in Romans 1, 7, even as he begins the letter to uh, the Romans. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's like, you know, he's wishing them and saying, may the grace and peace of God the Father and Jesus Christ be with you. So it's like a wish that he is expressing. And that is the format which is followed in almost all the New Testament letters. But here, John is not you know, making a wish and saying, may the grace, mercy, and peace of God be with you. He says, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us in truth and love. You know, He's making a statement rather than just um, offering a wish because he wants to establish that we, the true church, who are believing in the true doctrine and walking in love, we are the ones who will definitely enjoy grace, mercy, and peace, you know, which comes from God the Father and from uh, his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, so he affirms that. He makes it like a, a clear statement. And then um, uh, he also emphasizes the fact that Jesus is the Father's son. Um, so all these um, you know, facts are brought out right at the very beginning of this very brief letter. Um, and uh, he uh, you know, concludes with these, with these words, in truth and love. Uh, he's basically saying, so if you are holding on to the truth, the true doctrine, and if you are practicing love towards one another, even as the true doctrine you know, commands that you should do, then 
you are the people who will enjoy grace mercy and peace so he makes his opening statement it's a theological statement with which he is beginning his letter and then because you know uh, we are living in the truth in this manner he goes on to say it has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth just as the father commanded us you know so um, he is so full of joy that this church to to which he has sent the letter has not been deceived by the false teachers that they have been able to hold on to the truth and now he you know asks them one additional thing he says i'm so glad to see that your children your spiritual children are all walking in the truth but you know he adds one more thing and now dear lady he says in verse 5 i am not writing a new command but one we have had from the beginning i ask that we love one another so he says i'm so glad that you're walking in the truth of the true doctrine but one more thing could you also please you know operate in love towards one another and over there um, i mean the greek grammar is supposed to be the present subjunctive form of the verb to love which basically means you know it's like an ongoing love on a daily basis you need to continue walking in love operating in love towards one another uh, so uh, he says that and then he clarifies and says this is what i mean when i say that you should you know operate in love towards one another uh, so he in verse 6 he explains and this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands as you have heard from the beginning his command is that you walk in love you know so all the commands of the lord are are summarized fulfilled in this one commandment to love like jesus had explained earlier you know in in many of the other um, gospels uh, for instance in matthew chapter 22 uh, verses 37 to 40 uh, this is what jesus says regarding love uh, matthew chapter 22 Verses thirty-seven to forty. Now, if someone could please turn to Matthew chapter twenty-two, verses thirty-seven to forty. Uh, let's look at what Jesus says about commandments and about love uh, in this particular passage. Matthew twenty-two, thirty-seven to forty. Matthew chapter twenty-two verses thirty-seven to forty. Jesus said unto him, "Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it: Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets." While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them. Yeah. uh yeah verse 40 so here we see uh that jesus says all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments you know it's like as if these two commandments are hooks and the entire law the entire prophets everything that uh, has been proclaimed in the old testament it's all hanging on just these two commandments so if a person can keep this command to walk in love then automatically all the uh, that god has required of us in the law and in the prophets it it automatically gets fulfilled so therefore you know if john is saying here in this letter uh, i'm glad to see that you have not gone after false doctrines that you have held on to the truth and now my second request is please also walk in love um because walking in love you know automatically is is equal to obeying all the commandments of the uh, lord now um moving into verses 7 8 and 9 um if we can have someone read out uh you know uh here we have a lot of noise um if someone online could read out for us uh, verses 
8 and 9, please. I'm so sorry that I have to you know, keep like begging and requesting, but this is a classroom setup, and you are required to have your Bibles with you and read out. So please, if you could cooperate, uh, verses 7, 8, and 9. For many, look at yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for but that we may receive a full reward whosoever transgresses i'm so and sorry but it's uh second john that we are looking at uh the second I letter of here. john uh in second letter of that one um it talks about deceivers and antichrist yeah, seven, eight, and nine, please. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Seven, okay. eight, and nine. For many deceivers have gone out in the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look at yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses and does not obey, abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, here he says uh, there are many deceivers who are not acknowledging that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and they have gone out into the world. What he is saying over here, John, uh, contrasts what is said in the rest of the New Testament. You see, whenever the Antichrist is mentioned in the other uh, places in the New Testament, it's always talking about the Antichrist as somebody who is in the world and who is attacking the church. But here, John is the only person who talks about Antichrists who are inside the church and who have now gone out into the world. So he is saying something that is, um, that is contradictory to what is said in the rest of the New Testament. Uh, the general assumption that Christians have uh, is that this word Antichrist is mentioned in Revelation. But actually, that is not true. Uh, the word Antichrist is not mentioned anywhere in Revelation um, or, in fact, anywhere else in the New Testament. It's John. John is the only person who mentions this particular term Antichrist. In um, the other places, where this Antichrist figure is described, uh, he, there are other terms that are used to talk about him. Uh, in Matthew 24, 15, Jesus talks about this Antichrist figure. And, the, the, and the, uh, the term that he uses to describe him, he calls him the abomination that causes desolation. Uh, in Matthew 24, 15, and also in Mark 13, 14, uh, this Antichrist figure is described as the abomination that causes desolation. And then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, where uh, this, this particular Antichrist figure is talked about, uh, he is described as the man of lawlessness. He is described as the man doomed to destruction. And then in Revelation, uh, in a couple of places, you know, Revelation 13 and also in Revelation 11, uh, where uh, this, this person is talked about, he is just described as the beast. So in none of these places is the term Antichrist used. It's only um, John who uses this particular phrase. Uh, so in these places where, you know, in Matthew and 2 Thessalonians and Revelation, where this particular figure is talked about, he is somebody who is in the world, and from uh, his position in the world, his position of power in the world, he attacks the church. He works against the church. But here, when John is using this particular term, Antichrist, uh, you know, in uh, in First John, uh, and also here in Second John, he's the one person who's using this term to talk about people who are 
preaching false Christs, anti-Christs in that sense. You know, they he they are preaching false Christs. They are giving a false doctrine about Christ. Uh, so in First John chapter two, uh, verses eighteen to nineteen, and in twenty-two, he talks about. Uh, you know, if you remember, we 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 covered it at that time. He says in First John chapter two, verse eighteen, uh, "Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come." And then he describes them, uh, and he says, "You know, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us." So he talks about this anti. So he admits that there is one antichrist figure who will be coming in the end. But in the meantime, many many other antichrists have come, and these are the people who were in the church, part of the church of God, but then they chose to go after false doctrines and they left the church. And he says in that same chapter, First John chapter two, he says, oh, "Who is the liar?" It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. So all such people are antichrists. And then in First John chapter four, he again repeats the same concept. He says, "Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God," and he calls it an antichrist. So uh, here in Second John, uh, you know the the verse which brother read out just now. Again, it says. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, they are the antichrist. So he is referring to these antichrists or false Christs, um, this doctrine of false Christs, which is being presented by these false teachers. Uh, you know, when he talks about deceivers. So these are people who are literally in the church, and then um, they went out of the church. And began to work against the uh, church. So he says uh, in verse eight, "Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully." So these people, these antichrists who chose to leave the church and go after false doctrines, who began to preach a false Christ, they did not receive their reward. I mean, um, they could have been part of the true church. They could have made a true commitment to Christ, but they chose to leave the truth of the gospel behind, and so they lost out on the reward which they could have had. So now John says, "You know, watch out that you don't get into the same danger." He says, "We have worked for this. We have worked hard to bring the truth to you, to share the gospel with you. Now, don't be led away. Don't lose out on the reward which can be yours." You know. So he urges. Uh, the the believers to continue holding on to the truth so that they can receive their full reward, and and then he goes on to say something nice in uh, uh, verses nine and ten, mm, and maybe uh, if, if if we could have uh, you know uh, someone read out for us verses nine, ten, and eleven. Nine, ten, and eleven. Whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Amen. Amen. Um, so, in verse nine, this is what uh, John says. Uh, in the NIV, it, it reads as anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Um, they are running ahead of what has been taught, and they are bringing in new concepts. You know, in that sense. Um, so, they feel. That whatever has been taught so far has now become stale, has now become boring. So they feel that something new has to be brought in, something new has to be added, and uh, so they are running after all these uh, spirits, which are bringing all kinds of new revelations 
you know that uh, greek word geno sis gnosis so they say so they they are going after these spirits which are coming to them in night visions and presenting them with new gnosis with new revelations and so they feel that uh, now something new is being added to the original gospel which was taught and uh, they feel that this is now a higher knowledge that this is somehow more special than what was presented to them you know earlier by uh, the apostles um, so john is saying people like this who are running ahead they actually do not have god they are proclaiming and saying that the spirits are now giving them new special divine uh, revelations but actually they don't even have god he says on the other hand continue to hold on to the teaching of christ which was taught to you because if you do that then you will have both the father and the son you will have god but if you want to have these new revelations which the which they say the holy spirit is giving them when it's actually some other spirits which are giving them those revelations you know if you are holding on to such things you are actually running ahead of what was taught and you lose out on 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 having god uh, so it's it's a warning that he gives to them and it's a warning that maybe we too should you know pay attention to today because um people feel that the gospel message is too simple it's just it just talks about the cross it talks about us uh, placing our faith in the finished work of the cross and if we pl place our faith in it then yes god grants us salvation and he begins his work of sanctification in us nothing fancy in it uh, nothing that sounds very uh, philosophical or grand and so people try to bring in new um, you know ideas new themes they take the familiar passages and they try to bring out um, new um, you know creative sermons uh, the whole emphasis seems to be on how creative you can be you know in taking the familiar passages and bringing out some new revelations out of it and in the process of doing that um, they may actually be uh, corrupting the original gospel that was taught and that's a very dangerous thing so people who sit in the congregation and listen to all this new kind of um, of revelations that are being brought out of, from the familiar verses the congregation thinks oh wow that sounds so good oh wow you know this is a new angle that we are giving to this verse but did god want us to really look at that particular verse from that new angle so you know when we are coming when when we hear this new creative very innovative sermons uh, based on familiar scriptures we need to really carefully sit down and ask ourselves in the overall context of what this you know uh, passage is saying does this make sense did the original writer whom god inspired whom the holy spirit inspired did the holy spirit inspire that person to mean this or was the or was the holy spirit conveying a much simpler message a very straightforward message and it's very very important for us to hold on to that original message which the holy spirit wanted to convey through the writer nowadays the emphasis is on creativity the emphasis is on how intelligent you can be in um, in in saying things which can grab the attention of the listener but it's dangerous these things will lead us away from the power of the gospel because in the in the original simple gospel which was first presented there was the power of the cross resided in that and so uh, you know we have pastors who don't run after these innovative sermons they just simply present the simple truth and it may not sound very interesting and creative but there's power in that for the people who believe in it and base their lives on it it builds up their lives it builds up an eternal future for them there is a reward awaiting them in heaven when they you know just stand on this basic simple teachings and follow them so let us not be too eager to run after a uh, very fancy creative 
sermons which are really not bringing out the basic truth of what the holy spirit wanted conveyed you know so we need to be careful regarding that um you know um, uh, it, in the in the early 1800s uh, when mormonism first you know began to uh, uh, spread a lot of christians were attracted to it because it was talking about new things you know i mean uh, john smith who started the the mormon uh, religion um, he claimed that an angel had come to him and was now giving new revelations which were throwing light on what the bible had taught so far so he was saying that the angel is now granting him new revelations further truths regarding what the bible has already said and so he began to corrupt the original teaching that was contained in the bible uh, he said yes the bible does talk about hell but then um, there are now new truths which the angel has revealed uh, based on which you know he said that uh, oh hell is not really eternal people who want who go to hell will also get a second chance and then you know they will no longer be in hell and you know, they'll be able to you know uh, get salvation so he began to add new extra revelations which he claimed had come from an angel so it might have been a dark angel an angel of darkness that revealed those things to him you know it, because it was warping it was corrupting the actual truth um and he also said that um you know uh, the uh, that angelic being uh, has you know um, given approval for polygamy so he took multiple wives uh, he did not really believe in the genesis passage which talks about you know uh, cleaving to one uh, companion and staying true to her so uh, you know he so people were attracted to these new revelations because they appealed to their flesh and uh, so they were getting uh, led away from the truth so people can say that you know an angel has come to me and given me this new revelation regarding this bible passage and they may start saying something that is not upheld by the rest of the scriptures so whenever we hear something completely new which we have not heard before it is always good to sit down and look at what the rest of scripture says and does it back up and support this new concept which this person is bringing in if it is if it is if the rest of scripture is not backing up what this person is saying then maybe we should you know uh, consider from which spirit this teaching has come it may not be from the holy spirit it may be from a false spirit uh, so we need to be on our guard regarding these things because what does um, john say over here he says watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for but that you may be rewarded fully let us not lose out on the eternal reward that is awaiting us just because you know we got sidelined by some fancy teaching um the basic truth of the gospel has the power in it uh, to to win for us a great great reward so even though it may not sound very fancy to our human ears let us hold on to it because the reward that we will get from standing on the simple facts the simple teachings that reward is eternal it's great um, so you know he is is asking the uh, congregation not to run the head and and go after these novel new teachings but to hold on to the teaching of christ because then you will have god he says you will have both the father and the son you know because uh, that's basically what even jesus had said earlier in uh, the gospel of john john 14:23 where jesus says if anyone loves me he will obey my teaching he will not run after other teachings he will obey my teaching uh, and in john 14:23 jesus says if anyone loves me he will obey my teaching my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him so through the holy spirit we literally have the father and son also living with us in us you know they have come to us and they have made their home in us that is a privilege that we have if we hold on to the simple basic teaching of christ so let us not be too eager to run after new teachings and lose out on god on having god uh, you know is, is what 
uh, John is saying over here. And therefore, he says in verse 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or greet them. So he is saying, you know, don't uh, you know invite them into your home to stay in, at your place, and don't, in fact, don't even greet them is what he says, uh, because in, in in those days you had traveling preachers and traveling teachers. Uh, so if anyone has a um, ministry gifting, uh, I mean, a, a, a gifting of teaching, yeah, a ministry gifting of teaching. Uh, God would ask that person basically to go from place to place, uh, you know, um, expounding on the scriptures, building up the believers in the faith. Uh, you know, so they didn't have uh, access to Zoom and Google Classroom, you know, back then. So you would literally have that those teachers would literally have to go from town to town and do their teaching. Uh, so when they would go to a new place, they don't know anyone in that place. And obviously, the unbelievers in that place would not bother to give them any shelter. So basically, they would go to the doors of Christians and say, you know, please, can you let me stay here for a few days? Because, you know, the Lord has sent me to teach. And I, I, I want to, you know, uh, minister in this place. Please, can you shelter me for a few days? Now, back then in those days, they did have lodging facilities. Uh, there were inns, uh, you know, some kind of uh, a kind of primitive hotel kind of a thing. They did have those, but there was no security in such places uh, because you see, this is an outsider who has come from somewhere. And uh, so the locals can take advantage of them. If they uh, you know, if their belongings are stolen, uh, they can't just walk up to the nearest police station you know, and file a complaint. Uh, because back then, every town would have its own um, law enforcement uh, you know, people, you know, a few people who are kind of you know, looking after the law and order in that place. And their loyalty will basically be towards the people of that place, of that town. They would, in fact, not really care about these outsiders who are coming over there. You know, here, when, I mean, now in our modern day, we have this centralized uh, law and order uh, where you have police stations all coming under one main government. Uh, so, you know, you can go to any place and you will get your rights and privileges. And if your rights and privileges are violated, you can go to the police station and you can claim your rights and privileges. But back then, each town would be functioning more as a independent uh, you know, unit. So the local law enforcement body would show more loyalty to the lo locals rather than to outsiders, strangers who have come from somewhere else. So people did not feel safe staying in those lodging facilities. They would rather go stay with a family that they trust. And so you would have these poor missionaries, you know, these teachers who would be coming to the door of somebody and saying, please, you know, you're a believer, I'm a believer. Please, can you can I stay here for a few days um, so that I can minister to the people in this place, so that I can share the gospel over here, so that I can build up the believers. And so, uh, you know, um, Believers with, with good hearts would open their doors, welcome them, allow them to stay, uh, you know, feed them, uh, look after them. Um, but if someone is coming with false teachings, John is saying, please don't open your doors to them. You know, so he is giving a warning over here, and he's saying even such people may be coming. And so he says in verse eleven, anyone who greets them shares in their wicked work. So it's not just you showing kindness to somebody and you know, allowing them to come and you know, eat at your place and you know rest at your place. What you're actually doing is you're participating in their wicked work of spreading false teachings. So he says, be very careful what kind of people you're showing hospitality to. So if you have false teachers coming with false doctrines, do not take them into your home. In fact, he says, don't even greet them, you know, uh, because the greeting in those days would be something like, you know, may the Lord be with you, may the Lord bless you, or something like that. So don't even speak a greeting over them because they don't deserve it. They are preaching a false doctrine. Because uh, this was basically what was happening. You had all these uh, new believers 
who love the Lord, who want to show the love of God. And then you would have these wolves who are coming in sheep's clothing to their door. And these innocent people are inviting people into their homes who are bringing in false doctrines. And the church is getting corrupted. And so people are going out of the church into these false communities, you know, which are, um, you know, um, um, proclaiming Gnosticism. So that was the danger that they were facing. So he says there are going to be people who are going to come to you, you know, in, um, in you know, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. Be on the watch, be on the guard. And if you suspect that what they are preaching is false, do not entertain them. Do not allow them, you know, into your homes. Because if you do that, it's almost equal to you sharing in their wicked work. Uh, so having given this warning, uh, he, you know, he um, comes to the conclusion of the letter. And he says, I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face. Why, why does he want to talk with them face to face? So that our joy may be complete, he says. So um, usually, you know, in those uh, in those days when they would write a letter, uh, it was considered polite uh, to conclude with the words where you would, where you would say, "Oh, I wish I didn't have to just send you a letter. I wish I could actually be there and talk to you face to face." That, that is a you know way of greeting. But here, John is adding something to that, and he says, "I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face, so that." our joy may be complete. You know, he talked about this in, earlier in verse 4, where he talked about how joyful he is to see them walking in the truth. So he says, if I can come there and see you people holding on to the truth, you know, guarding yourselves, not allowing these wrong uh, false teachers to come into your homes and deceive you, if I can see all that with my own eyes, then my joy will indeed be complete. You know, because John... And all these other disciples of Jesus, they worked very, very hard to build up that early church. I mean, there were so many wolves at that time attacking the church. So many false teachers, you know, because Satan wanted to take away the power of the cross. He wanted to somehow quash that very important truth. And so uh, there were this, all these people attacking the young church. And the church was in its early nascent stages. So at that time, these apostles worked very, very hard to build up the believers. So for them, you know, to see anyone falling away from the faith and going away into false doctrines was painful. These are people whom they had, you know, birthed through much prayer, uh, that who, whose lives they had built up with so much love and with so much sacrifice. And to, so to see them being torn away from the church by false doctrines was a very, very painful thing. And so that is why he says, I want to come over there. There's so much that I want to share with you, so much that I want to teach you. But I want to do that face to face. And when I come over there and see you holding on to the truth, what joy it will give me. So for these people, you know, in the early days, it was not just some ministry that they were doing. This was something uh, so some something so personal. So do we feel in the same way regarding ministry today? Is it something so personal to you? No way you really care about the people that you're ministering to. Where you feel a burden for the people that you're you know, sharing the gospel with. Uh, that is the kind of passion that we too should have for the people that we are ministering to today. It must literally hurt when we see someone falling away from the truth. It literally hurts uh, because you have invested that much prayer, that much tears you know, in building them up. So now when they are, when you see them falling away, it literally hurts and you want to, like a parent, you literally want to grab hold of them and bring them back home. You know, so that was the passion which we see uh, that these apostles, uh, these early leaders had uh, for the people that they were ministering to. Yeah, so um, when we come back from the break, uh, we'll look at the, the uh, third letter of John. Thank you.